the father took off across the field. But what he told me was that snow had fallen. It was about up to his shins. He was wearing a great coat and a helmet. Any of you who have run with full pack know what that's like. He said he couldn't hear anything except the sound of his own breathing. And then, as the Americans began firing, he took his hand, I'll try not to destroy the microphone as I do this, but he took his hand and slapped it against his chest. And he said he could hear the sound of bullets impacting people behind him. At one point, he realized that he couldn't stand it anymore, and he turned around to see who else was with him, and he realized he was the only one left. He was still not even halfway across the field. And realizing that he didn't have much longer to live if he stayed on his feet, he fell down on his face in the snow and lay there. The attack came in from the side. There was a mortar barrage. It failed. The Americans retained possession of the houses. The German infantry pulled back into the forest. Things were burning. He lay there until it was dark. At which point the Americans came down from the village and began looking through the German bodies for maps or cigarettes or anything of use. In the darkness he was turned over and had his pockets rifled by an American soldier. After the Americans went away, he tried to crawl back into the forest, but his hands and his feet were so cold that he could only move by crawling on his elbows and his knees. And he crawled into the forest to a burning vehicle and held his hands against the molten rubber of a tire until he could feel his hands again. After that, he was joined up with some, other, uh, with some other groups. Shortly after that, the entire 12th SS was withdrawn from the combat zone. They were then sent to Hungary, um, where they spent most of their time running away from the Russians. Three days later, I went back to school in England. And any of you who perhaps remember those long sepulchral train rides, um, if you've done those, you get to, you get to this, the coast, uh, Dunkirk or wherever it is, you catch the ferry across and you're in Victoria by seven in the morning, the long, dreary, smoke-filled carriages. Um, we had been traveling through an area so black, it looked as if the windows had been lacquered. I stopped, the train stopped, in the city of Liège in eastern Belgium. And I got out on the platform and I looked down into the street, the platform in Liège is raised above the, the level of the town, you have to go down into the town. I saw one sign, and it was pointing in the opposite direction. It was blue and white, and it just had one word on it, and the word was Arden. And if I had thought about what I did next, I would never have done it. But I got off the train, I got my pack, I got off the train, and I watched the train heading off towards the coast. <coughs> And then I got on another train heading in the other direction. And another train and a bus. And by about halfway through that afternoon, I had made it to the village that he spoke about. The village is called Rosherath. There is a twin village called Krinkelt Rosherath on the Belgian-German border. And it's where a lot of this fighting took place. I walked across what I assumed to be the field. It seemed to be the only one and into the forest. By this time, I thought I was hallucinating. I really had no idea what I was doing. I was going to be in all kinds of trouble when I got back to school in England, and I still wasn't absolutely sure why I was doing what I was doing. And the truth is, I spent about the next 10 years trying to figure it out. I went into the forest, and the thing that threw me, the thing that probably drove itself like a spike most deeply into my brain, was that I had expected not to find anything other than pine needles. Somehow I had expected everything to be cleared up and sanitized. But the ground was littered with foxholes, with ammunition, with rusted gas mask canisters, um, pieces of artillery shells. I found myself standing amongst the rubble of this conflict almost as if it had just happened. And somehow at that point in time, time itself seemed to accordion. So this man who had become, in some ways, like my own father, having gone from my father to being one of the great ghouls of the 20th century, I found myself somehow disjointed um, out of the present and into the past. That's about the best way I can describe it. I went back to school in England and did my very best to forget about it, but I couldn't. And what came from that eventually, um, I will talk about at the end of the talk. But this thing kept tapping away like a woodpecker in my head until eventually I had to do something about it. <coughs> Understand your enemy, and you are halfway 
towards defeating him. Here is the clearest explanation I can give of why people no less sane than you or I not only voted Adolf Hitler into power, but stood by him even when it was clear that he was leading his country towards another war. It would be this. A 50 million mark note, which I actually have here, and I will pass around. In 1914, it was four marks to the dollar. That means that this note, which is 100,000 marks, would be worth $25,000. And this one, 200,000 marks. And this one, 50 million, a billion marks. It's all real. I'll hand it out so you can have a look at it. Perhaps you've seen these things before. By 1922, the dollar was worth 7,000 marks. Remember, 1914, 4 marks. By 1922, 7,000 marks. By 1923, $1, 4.2 million marks. Now, that might not mean much to you, so let's put it into figures that do mean something. The average American, I looked this up today, if you settled all your debts and cashed in everything you owned, if you were an average American, you would have about $100,000. If you settled all your debts, cashed in your possessions, you would have, as an average American, $100,000. What would have happened to that $100,000 if you lived in Germany during the time of these people? Your $100,000 is worth $100,000 in 1914. By 1922, your $100,000 is worth $6.08. By 1923, your $100,000 is worth $2.85. I suppose that ought to speak for itself. Why people pushed to the brink of oblivion chose to back a man who not only promised but delivered to restore not only their economy but their self-respect, even when it was clear that he was leading them towards a war. In order to maintain this man's grip on society, he needed a private army of sorts. He needed this army because his main opposition, the communists, also had a private army. I'm sorry this is so rushed. This is a lot of history crammed into a very small space. This private army was known as the SR, the Sturmabteilung, the brown shirts. They wore ceremonial daggers, uh, which were brown, uh, brown lacquered handles, brown, uh, wooden, brown lacquered scabbards, wooden handles, and engraved in acid on the blades the motto, Alles für Deutschland, means everything for Germany. At the same time, a smaller group was formed within the SA. This was, in fact, just a bodyguard. These were known as the Schutzstaffel, which was then shortened to SS Schutzstaffel, in 1925, there were between 23 and 30 members scattered across the country. In 1929, there were only 280 members, run by a man named Heinrich Himmler. Their motto was, Meine Ehre heißt Treue, which means, my honor is loyalty. There is a significant, particularly to the German mind, a great sig significant difference between these two mottos, which I will explain. After Hitler was elected to power in 1933, he became legitimate. He now had all the power of the state behind him. He no longer needed his private army. And the private army now numbered over two million men, looking something like this. In fact, by 1938, there were over uh, three million. But something happened to them beforehand which firmly established Hitler's control, not only over the country, but over his own National Socialist organization. By 1933, the SS had grown to 30,000 men, a significant number, but still nothing like the SA. This all changed on an event called the Night of the Long Knives, these ceremonial daggers, which I'll show you. <coughs> 